Okay, we'll start the afternoon session. Uh, the next speaker is Merchi Michel, uh, who is our own at, at Rutgers. He completed his PhD at the University of Rochester, and then he did a postdoc uh, at the Center for Perceptual Systems at the University of Texas at Austin. And he, his, the three main areas that he works with uh, are to integrate sensory information and make perceptual judgments, uh, how the system exploits statistical regularities in the environment, and then how we adapt to those uh, violations of statistical regularities. Um, so, he, the central theme to his um, treatment of vision is he sees vision as a problem of probabilistic inference and the use of ideal observer in, in uh, setting up experiments and interpreting the data. So, uh, he's a very solid citizen. We're extremely happy to have him at Rutgers. And without further ado, I present um, I'm Merci Michel. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, though, I, I know Jan's work. I, 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 this is my first time meeting him personally, so I don't have any colorful anecdotes uh, like some of the other speakers may have. Um, and um, what, what I'm going to talk about today is actually, a, it's, it's a little, a feel from what um, Tom, Tom said about me, uh, Tom said about me in his, in his introduction. Um, but I thought, I, I looked at the, um, the set of speakers, and it seemed to be a good mix of, of, of uh, discussion about uh, geometry and uh, perception of visual shape and visual form and, um, and some of the physiology behind it. And so there's a project that I've worked on. This is uh, uh, work in collaboration with um, Al Seidman and Bill Geisler um, that I haven't gotten a, a lot of uh, chance to talk about. Um, and that intersects nicely with, the, with these themes. So I'll talk about that today. Uh, and so the, the title of the talk is What Can Cortical Topography Tell Us About Shape Perception? And what I'm really interested in is um, the extent to which shape perception, uh, at least coarse shape perception, um, is, is either influenced by or reflected in um, cortical topography. So first, just, just, just a quick statement about um, uh, about topography. So topography is one of these things that's it's um, seen throughout the uh, sensory system, um, and actually more than just the sensory system. So uh, familiarly, we have the, the homunculi in the somatosensory, uh, primary somatosensory and motor cortices. You have tonotopy um, in uh, auditory cortex, primary auditory cortex. And then in B1, you have retinotopy, you have ocular dominance columns, you have uh, orientation, uh, and then there's even spatial frequency. Um, uh, there's a topography of, of uh, spatial frequency as well. Uh, okay, and so um, so these are uh, uh, examples just showing the, uh, uh, the, the retinal topography, so you can see how a color pattern on a screen of uh, individual fields is mapped onto the um, cortex here, that's of a macaque. Um, and then on the, sorry, on the right, you can see um, how orientation um, is represented in a little patch of cortex. Okay. Um, so this organization is great from the point of view of people who record from cortex, even, even whether you do it through imaging or uh, single unit recording like Tony was talking about, it helps to have units that do similar things together because if you're hunting um, uh, with an electrode to try to find um, uh, nerves that respond in a particular way, it's a lot easier if they're close together. And, and uh, imaging techniques like VSDI, uh, Volsion Sensitive Dye Imaging, which I'm going to talk about, or uh, fMRI uh, and other techniques uh, wouldn't work if the uh, neurons that um, they don't have so because of space, spatial resolution concerns they wouldn't work if the neurons were very diffuse. Okay, the so neurons that um, that responded to common locations in the retina or um, 
common orientations were, um, were, were very diffusely distributed. So it's been really useful for researchers, but we don't know what role it plays. And in, in vision, in particular, there are a couple of really good examples. So um, squirrel monkeys, for example, seem to have uh, normal stereo vision, but they don't have um, ocular dominance columns, right? And originally, it was thought that maybe that's one of the things that having ocular dominance columns uh, subserves binocular vision. Um, and then um, rodents don't have orientation columns at all. And squirrels, so lots of rodents are not very visual animals, but squirrels that are very visual that seem to have really good um, uh, contrast sensitivity and acuity and um, orientation tuning that looks like uh, that that you see in primates, they don't have orientation columns. So we don't know what purpose these serve, and, and it's a sort of central problem in, um, or, or a classic question in, um, in uh, sensor physiology is whether these are just epiphenomena or whether they actually uh, tell us something about uh, how we represent, uh, or whether they actually form a, a, a functional role, play a functional role. Okay, so just to get an overview, this is a cartoon, but this is actually based on um, the, uh, um, the measurements in the actual uh, area that we're, we're going to be looking at. So, um, so this is how shape perception might be um, how topography might uh, subserve shape perception. Uh, so on the top I have visual stimulus, this piece just represents stimuli in the visual field, right, I have those two squares and the uh, circle that are each represented by uh, carrier texture. Um, and then I'm showing you at the, you can look at the uh, V1 response at at least two different levels, one of which is the uh, retinotopic level, and you can see that the shape is represented, a distorted version of the shape is represented at the retinotopic level. And, and then you can, if you zoom in, uh, so for example, if you want to distinguish between squares and circles, um, if you're an, a, a researcher looking at this, um, at this uh, pattern of responses in the brain, um, you, could, you could distinguish between squares and circles at this level, but um, to distinguish between um, uh, orientations, you'd have to look at a, um, so if you want to distinguish between the first two, um, you'd have to look at a, a finer scale. All right, and these sorts of, uh, I'm going to mainly be talking about these sort of gradient defined um, shapes, but these sorts of figures appear um, a lot in the natural world, right? You've got, so uh, Tony talked a little bit about um, stuff, and uh, stuff is often bounded by things. We can think of it that way. If you, if, if, in his original picture, he had these edges that were bounding areas of stuff. Okay. Um, and so again, the central question is whether the retinotopic extent of activation V1 uh, might provide or at least reflect signals that are used to make coarse shape judgments, like the one that I, I just showed you. And so um, this project originally started when uh, um, AL had been recording um, from uh, V1 using uh, these little Gabor um, patterns. Um, and so this is one of the conditions that I'll talk about a little later in the, in the talk. But, um, uh, and he noticed that there was this asymmetry that went along with uh, orientation. Um, and we, we really started by asking whether this might be a signal that, that's reflected in, in perceptual responses. And we had, just internally within the lab, we had three different responses to this, right? So one is, of course not, okay? So, uh, so, so might these uh, uh, be used in shape judgments? One answer is, of course not. So, of course not because, um, right, no one's, look, no one's inside the head looking at the cortical response like we researchers are, okay? So, in, depth, in, in principle, what does the spatial organization of the response make? Um, and uh, um, in principle, the decoder could be arbitrarily complex, right? So you're, you, you're reading information from many different parts. If you think about this as like a, um, uh, uh, an arbitrary neural network, um, it doesn't matter where the units are located. Um, a second, uh, second response that we had was, well, of course, but only trivially. Right? So in some sense, there are ways in which 
topography tells us a lot. Um, it's predictive of things like how well we can discriminate between um, between two objects, uh, or um, so the size of the representation in the uh, in, in, in in cortex tells us something about how sensitive we are, right? So, for example, the fovea is uh, represented by uh, up in, as a larger area, but that's just because you have more neurons. That that's just because the the um, the topography in that case uh, tells you something about how many units are representing the stimulus. Okay, um, and then there's the in terms of the you know does it reflect signals used to make coarse shape judgments? That seems sort of trivial too, in a way, in that receptive fields are associated with fixed retinotopic locations, right? At least in V1, and then the retinotopic extent in V1 is isomorphic with spatial extent in the visual field. That's what I just told you earlier. At least you know that's that's the story coming into this. Um, so if that's true, then it will be trivially true that uh, the retinotopic um, extent of activation will at least reflect the signals that are used to make coarse shape judgments. Okay, but we ended up doing this work anyway, and that's because there's a, the third response was, that's an interesting question. So, uh, first of all, topography likely reflects something about local processing. So, uh, Tony went through, um, in his talk, um, uh, talked about the fact, well, um, you know, the fact that you can think of V2, for example, as sort of seeing the output of the V1 map. And what that really reflects is this idea the standard model of uh, visual processing in the cortex is that you have an essentially hierarchical um, set of visual areas, and in, and and um, the idea is that you have a what's called a linear nonlinear um, cascade, so that you have uh, one area. So we can think of um, uh, we can think of the LGN, for example, in, in Tony's example, right? The LGN um, sees the output of the retina and um, does local pooling um, and some sort of local pooling and weighting and then uh, applies nonlinearity and that's the response at LGN. And then V1 does something similar to the output of, of, uh, of, of LGN and then V2 to V1 and so forth and so on. And beyond that, things are not quite that simple, um, but V1 in particular seems to play an important role in establishing the spatial framework for quote-unquote processing in many local in many um, later visual areas. So these are just um, uh, some examples that have been um, shown before. So uh, another thing that Tony had pointed out was the fact that as you move to higher and higher areas, so here the, this is V1, this is uh, V2, V3, uh, and then uh, L01. Um, so I'm going to ignore uh, L01 for now. Oh, sorry, so this is V2, V3, uh, and then human V4. Uh, so this is in human, this is in, in monkey. So uh, Brad Maher had first shown that um, if you, so in, in, uh, in, in V1, uh, receptive field sizes grow with eccentricity. In V4, the same thing happens, but it happens at sort of a different rate. But the important thing, the thing that uh, Brad Maher noticed is that if you just assume that the uh, V4 receptive fields of V4 neurons are formed by uh, sampling from sort of 2D Gaussian on the surface of, uh, of, of V1, so that's what this is representing, is the, so the, the uh, inflated surface of um, V1, then even though this, so these are two different, um, uh, the receptive fields of two different neurons are two different eccentricities, in V4, but if you map them onto uh, V1, it's sampled from the same area. And this just shows in humans now instead of uh, macaques, uh, and across several different areas that uh, here we're looking at population receptive fields, this is fMRI work, um, but that if you look at the um, sampling extent in terms of V1, that, it, that these are essentially flat. Right? So again, these are two uh, pieces of information suggesting that Something is looking at V1, right? Looking at V1, and um, uh, and that that something is areas V2, V3, and V4 in this case, or includes those, those areas. 
Um, okay, and then the final part is that this, this, all of this wouldn't be terribly interesting if uh, random topic extent were really isomorphic as a first claim. Um, but it turns out, you know, then, then you'd always reflect, it would still be trivial that you reflect um, the, uh, um, you'd reflect the signals used to make uh, course shape judgments. So the key thing here is that random topic extent is not isomorphic with spatial extent and the visual field. And so the, the main part of that is, is what I'll tell you about our, our experiment, but there's actually um, been, there was evidence of this uh, before we completed our work, which is just that the um, extent in D1 can vary with perceived size, even when the visual field extent is fixed, okay? And, and here's a, a, a particularly good example of that. So this is work from Murray Bayasi and, and Kirsten. Um, and so, in this experiment, this is an fMRI experiment, and what they had subjects do was um, they show them an image like this, so it's a sort of Ponzi uh, illusion experiment, and um, they had subjects fixated either the uh, front front sphere or back sphere, um, and then they these are these are sort of controls where you look at um, different physical sizes, and in those cases, these are um, just disks and not spheres. Um, but the idea is that if you look at um, if we well if we look at these two, uh, the size, the extent of activation in in um, in in human V1 should uh, should change as we look at these two. So it should be bigger for this one than for this one if you're fixating in the center. And there's here they're sort of showing that. So um, uh, I'm sorry. Each of these is uh, recording at a different eccentricity. Um, and along the x-axis here, we have uh, time, and then this is just the magnitude of the, um, uh, the MRI signal. And what you can see is that for, uh, for the, uh, uh, at the larger eccentricities, um, as over time, the, um, the response to the uh, bigger stimulus um, increases. So there's, much, there's more uh, separation between the, the, the two responses. And that is sort of summarized right here. Okay, so they're, it's just showing that the difference at each eccentricity between the, um, between the two. Okay, so the, um, the main result here is the fact that even when they're the same size, um, but they're perceived differently, you get that same difference. Okay, so in this case, um, presumably this is, re this is reflecting um, the, the difference in, in representation. Okay, so uh, we're going to do this a little bit differently, and so what we um, end up doing is dissociating the random topic extent of V1 population responses from the spatial uh, extent. Um, and um, do, we do this using text to define visual stimuli. Um, so first I'll walk through a uh, model V1 that we used. Um, so as I said, initially, um, AL had noticed this with a particular stimulus, and then we, uh, we, we checked it with a range of, of, of different stimuli. Um, but before we do that, we built a model of V1, uh, a simple model of V1, to try to understand where this um, uh, uh, this effect, where, you, where the random topic scale population response doesn't simply reflect the shape, but varies systematically with the orientation of the texture, um, where this comes from. Can we explain that? Uh, then we confirmed the broader result in monkey V1 using both sensitive dye imaging. And then we use the psychophysical task to see whether um, the systematic or the topic distortions by the shape judgment of human observers. And so I'll, I'll just sort of walk through um, what's going on. So uh, this is just a very simple model of um, responses of um, simple type cells to uh, Gabor. Okay, so if you have just a tiling of these sorts of um, uh, cells and you um, 
and you simulate the response to a, uh, a Gabor, you end up getting, if the Gabor, if the Gabor is circular and the, um, the receptive field shapes are, are circular, um, then you end up with, you end up with, with a circular response. That's not very surprising. Um, but the thing is that in cortex, in V1, the receptive fields aren't circular, they tend to be elongated. And so here yeah, I'm just showing that, right, if they were, I didn't draw a diagonal, perhaps I should have, but if, um, if they were circular, then you'd end up having, um, you'd end up having uh, uh, receptive fields lined up along this diagonal. The y-axis and the y-axis and x-axis here are basically just normalized length of the receptive field. Um, and so you can see they tend to be elongated, and in particular they're elongated in the direction um, uh, orthogonal to the orientation. So uh, in there is the direction um, opposite of the carrying modulation. Okay. Um, so if you now if you use elongated um, um, receptive fields, then the population responses that you tend to produce will not be elongated. Okay, and the way that you can think about this, the reason I have these, oops, the reason I have these little cartoons, is just so you can see what's happening is essentially when you have uh, stimuli that are well matched with the receptive field parameters, um, you're just get, so in, uh, um, you're gonna have more overlap between cells that are further away in um, uh, in this direction, rather than in the direction um, of the carrier modulation, right? So, yeah. So this is it's relatively straightforward. But the bottom line is that you get this elongation just from these properties of of um, of uh, V1 cells. Okay, so we constructed this V1 population response model. Um, uh, we're simulating population response to a two, point, a two, two by two um, degree patch of paraphobial visual field. And this is all meant to um, match uh, where we'll be collecting the data in the, um, in, in the monkey. Um, okay, and so this is just the schematic of what we did. So we just have, it's a very simple model. Uh, we just have this a response and a rectification step where we have a bunch of different receptive fields. Uh, we rectify the responses. We add this position scatter. All this is based on, on um, measurements made in uh, monkeys using um, signal cell recordings. Um, uh, then we end up with a spiking response. And then for, so what I'm, I'll start out by just showing this spiking response because right now this is going to be in the same um, coordinates as the uh, signal itself. Um, but later on, I'll show you, we eventually um, have to project that uh, onto the um, V1 map. Uh, and then use a sub-threshold transform. This is just because the response that we get in DSDI reflects um, membrane potential, so sub-threshold uh, activity rather than spiking activity. This is just some more details. Um, we, as I said, we, we randomly sample those the um, receptive field properties from um, values that have been measured before at the same eccentricity, uh, at roughly the same eccentricity in, in monkeys. Okay, and so these are the basic results. Um, uh, so when you have um, stimuli that are well matched to the um, G1 receptive field parameters, then you get an elongation here. The effect is a little bit subtle, um, but it is slightly elongated in this case, uh, slightly elongated horizontally, and in this case, it's slightly elongated um, vertically. Okay, and uh, we can make better predictions than that, so we can see as a function of, um, as you change the stimulus, um, you can change the spatial frequency, or you can change the contrast envelope size. These are ways of manipulating the, uh, the central frequency and the, um, the bandwidth, respectively. 
Um, and as, as we do that, uh, so as we move away from, uh, from the um, mean values, um, the, this aspect ratio difference goes away. Right? So this effect attenuates. So that's, that's the model. Um, so again, the, the, the idea is that you're going to get an effect of, um, I think you're going to get a disagreement between uh, remnant, the actual shape and um, the shape of the response. So you're going to have an elongation in the direction that of the, uh, uh, um, that's going to be elongated in the, um, along the direction of the, the stimulus. Um, and that effect is going to disappear as the size and spatial frequency parameters of the stimulus diverge from those of the added receptors. Okay, so now we'll look uh, in um, we'll look to, in, in V1 to see whether that actually happens. And so this is the basic setup. Uh, we have a camera that's looking through a microscope at a recording chamber. Uh, in this we have a piece of uh, this um, V1 that's perfused with a um, uh, voltage sensitive fluorescing dye um, and, um, and and it's, it, the behavior of the dye, the voltage of the dye uh, sorry, the, the luminance of the dye is essentially linear with, with voltage um, so that's not, um, and then what we end up doing is, is just taking, we play the stimulus the stimulus that I'm going to show you is play um, five times, in, it's flashed five times in succession, and we just take the, uh, we compute the, uh, uh, the um, energy, uh, the, the amplitude of that, at that frequency. All right, so here's a uh, schematized um, picture of our, uh, our setup. So in the, in the, uh, the actual stimulus will be presented in this part of the visual field, or was presented in this part of the visual field. Um, and that's represented um, roughly here in our window. Um, and again, you can just see it's, we're just going to have a distorted version of, uh, of this circle here, kind of the ellipse. Um, and in both cases, it's going to be an ellipse, so I'll, I'll show you in just a moment. Um, so here are our uh, two primary stimuli. Um, this is the horizontal divorce. Um, here I'm showing you the V1 response, the Gaussian fit, and then the effective uh, aspect ratio, ratio distortion in this case. Right? So because, in, because this is a... So I'm representing um, aspect ratio as the vertical uh, divided by the um, horizontal... Um, sorry, yeah, that's right. The vertical divided by the horizontal um, extent. Okay, and so um, so this show this is just showing you um, in the visual field um, what this looks like. This difference. You can see these are both actually. So we're sorry. Let me just make this a little bit clearer. What we're actually interested in is the difference in um, the difference in aspect ratio between these two. These both look elongated in the same direction, but that's after they've been um, distorted by the the REM topic map in V1. So if you uh, again the equivalent um, distortion uh, is what I'm presenting. Okay, so if we look at that um, across different, so we had three different monkeys that we ran in, in uh, when we ran this, and in each of those monkeys we got this effect. Okay, so the vertical, um, the the vertical over horizontal aspect ratios were larger for the um, for the vertical stimulus than for the horizontal stimulus. So, um, and then we also in one of the monkeys we looked at. Um, different manipulations, so you can 
uh, if this is truly an effect of uh, the, uh, the carrier orientation, then if we, put, we have something that's unoriented like a Gaussian or a plaid, uh, then those shouldn't show any aspect ratio, uh, shouldn't show any elongation, and they don't in this case. Um, and then you can also gradually um, change or uh, gradually change the orientation of the carrier, and you should get intermediate value in that sort of value. So that's the main result. Uh, the second result um, was that, um, as predicted, as we move away from the, um, the receptive field properties that match, uh, sorry, a, a stimulus, stimulus parameters that match the receptive field properties, so going from two cycles per degree to four cycles per degree, uh, the effect lessens. Um, and to look at this in more context, so the, here the curves represent uh, the predictions of our D1 model. Um, so at different envelope sizes, so that's going to control our bandwidth, um, and for different spatial frequencies. And while these, uh, so the, the uh, points here represent the, um, the, the data that we recorded from our monkeys, and while these don't overlap exactly, you can see that the trends are the same. So, um, so for um, uh, so for example, in our main condition, our main condition is this one, uh, where we have a uh, one third degree um, standard deviation, the envelope size, and th and so you see that the um, the aspect ratio. Um, difference drops as we go to higher spatial frequencies, but in some other cases, so uh, for a, 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 a for a, a cell that has a smaller um, receptive field, it tends to be tuned to higher spatial frequencies. So, uh, so in this case, you actually get sort of the opposite result when you're using a small um, small receptive. Field. So, um, so we built the model of D1 responses, right, uh, which told us how uh, random topic extent should be dissociated from uh, the actual uh, spatial extent of the stimulus. Um, and then we have these experiment, these uh, physiological results in three monkeys that confirm that um, the, the D1 population responses exhibit this random topic distortion. But we want to know, the crucial question is, do these retinotopic distortions influence perceptual judgments of shape? Okay. And in order to uh, determine that, the first thing that we needed to do is figure out how these should, how these would uh, be reflected in judgments of shape. Um, and so we have the mapping, I showed you a little earlier, the mapping from uh, the visual field to the um, uh, to the retinotopic mapping V1. And so we can use that to um, represent the cortical magnification factor, essentially. Okay, so just based on the cortical magnification factor, how, if we presented, say, this Gaussian versus this Gaussian versus this Gaussian, uh, what shape um, should that have in, the, um, um, in our patch of cortex? Um, and then there's a, the second component that determines the size of the response is the cortical point image, right? Which is just the set, the cortical point image is just the, um, the set of all neurons that respond to a, to a point, essentially, in the, um, in the visual field. And um, we said we got the size of the cortical point image just by deconvolving de um, uh, this with this. And so we found the size of that. And then um, we ran our V1 model um, to determine the mapping for, now we can, for any arbitrary V1 response, we can determine, uh, we can decode an aspect ratio. Right? So, again, to go back here, uh, we know that if we present a stimulus with an aspect ratio of 2 in this case, that's going to look like this. Oops. 
that's going to have this shape in the uh, in B1. Uh, if we present something with an aspect ratio of one, it's going to have this shape. And now, if we present something with an aspect ratio of 0.5, which is just uh, horizontal aspect ratio of two, um, it's going to have this shape. And so we so what we want to do is go backwards. We want to look at the um, uh, the responses that we actually got in the uh, from the SDI and figure out what the decoded um, aspect ratio would be. Um, and so, so that's what this function represents. And in our case, for the two cycle per degree stimuli, um, this is what we got: 1.6 and um, 0.53. Okay. So the reason this is critical is right. If we got something that um, exceeded this effect in humans, then that would suggest that there's some other mechanism uh, causing that. Um, but as you'll see, we didn't get that. Okay, so then we, we are kind of actually psychophysical measurements to see whether the human observers um, actually exhibited uh, the, whether they perceived this difference in um, aspect ratio. So the task was this, they had, they'd see a blank screen, they had to fixate the center of that screen, and then they had to make a, a total turn and force choice task about which of the two stimuli that we presented were, uh, was more circular than the other. Okay, so they got one stimulus that was, that could be elongated along either axis, uh, and then they got a standard that could also be elongated along either axis, but it was, this is a flat, so the idea is that this is unoriented. Um, okay. Uh, and, and these were, the comparisons were chosen as continuously variable aspect ratio standard, centered on the uh, standard aspect ratio. I'm not going to walk through this too much. Um, we made a couple of assumptions. We, we assume essentially that, uh, we assume what the Weber's law scaling of um, aspect ratio discrimination thresholds. And the main reason I introduced this is because we have these two parameters. Um, one, this beta sub c, which is the, it's essentially the bias in the comparison. Um, and this um, gamma term, which is a, um, uh, an adjusted guessing rate. Um, so the bias term represents the scaling that must be applied to the comparison to make it appear equivalent to the standard. So this is going to be, that's going to be, if, if bc is negative, then that means I need to squash this to make it look circular, or to make it look like the standard. Uh, and if, if um, BC is um, positive, then it means I need to uh, I need to stretch it. Okay. And so here I'll just I'll, I'll just show you the, this is just the layout of the plot that I'll show you in a moment. Um, so in this case, the standard uh, is. Is a, is a circular um, plaid. And moving in this direction, right, so we have the aspect ratio of the comparison divided by the aspect ratio of the standard. As we move uh, in, uh, as we move to the, uh, to the right, um, the, um, we're, we're basically squashing it in the, in the horizontal direction. Uh, uh, sorry, squashing it in the vertical direction. And as we move to the as we move to the left, we're uh, stretching in the vertical direction. Okay, and then as we so the different colors um, represent different standards. So in this case, I have a standard that is not that is um, uh, that is not circular. Um, okay, and so the point at which I'm going to say the standard is more circular or the standard is equally, like, is, is equally circular, is going to be um, at some point when the, um, the comparison is actually stretched a bit. Okay, and then I'm just changing the value of the, the aspect of the standard. And so what we should get is a family of curves like this. Um, and the, the, um, the, Points where these curves uh, cross one are the points of um, subjective equality, and the points 
where these are are um, where these uh, lines, uh, sorry, where these curves hit a slope of zero, just represent places where uh, these are points of subjective circularity. Okay, so it, there's a lot going on there. Just to sort of explain what we what we what we expect to get is if the comparison appears vertically stretched, then oh, I, I forgot that I converted this to um, it's not log anymore. So if this is smaller, I, before I said if this is negative, then um, it means you have to, um, then that means that it, it, um, it appears vertically stretched, you have to squash it. it. Because this is not log units, it's actually if it's smaller than one, and this is if it's greater than one. Um, so, uh, so if the comparison appears vertically stretched, then we expect to see, sorry, then we expect to see uh, a BC of smaller than one, and and the diamond curves will look like this. If the comparison appears horizontally stretched or vertically squashed, then uh, we'll get a BC, uh, or sorry, beta C of um, greater than one. Okay, and then the other thing that can change is, is if there's a bias towards guessing, I talked about the, this uh, gamma parameter. Uh, if they're biased towards guessing standard, then this, all these curves are basically going to shift up. And if they're biased towards guessing comparison, all these points are going to shift down. Okay. I, I just mentioned this because we tip, typically we think of point of subjective quality always equals at 0.5, or always occurs at 0.5. But with this set of curves, you can actually measure uh, points of subjective quality even when they're biased towards guessing standard or comparison. So this is really important for cases in which there are differences in the um, standard and comparison that are final to the judgment that people are actually making. In this case, the standard is always a flat. Um, okay, so in the control condition, so this is sort of just a sanity check, right? Plaid versus plaid, uh, we get exactly what we expect. So you have a um, these, uh, um, BC is one, which means that they're perceived as the same size, the standard in comparison. And then this just confirms that our model works well, right? That our psychophysical model works well, all these points line out of the curves. Um, but in the experimental conditions, now we get these shifts. So in particular, when the, um, okay, so let's look at this. So when the uh, Gabor is um, vertically oriented, uh, it looks, we have to squash it. This is what this is saying. This is the fact that this is smaller than um, one means that we have to squash it to get it to look like a, um, like the standard. I'm oh, sorry, to get it to look circular. And then when the um, comparison is horizontal, we have to stretch it in the vertical direction to get it to look circular. Okay, that's just reflected um, down here. And then to look at all of our conditions, we also we did this for uh, two cycles per, per degree and for four cycles per degree, and we get the same result here. So uh, when we increase the spatial frequency without changing the, the envelope size, oops, um, this, this effect still exists, but it's reduced now. And, um, and finally, the, the, um, it's always important to look at individual data to see whether um, things hold. And uh, we ran 10, 10 subjects in this experiment, and eight of them showed significant effects, of, both significant effects of the illusion and a significant difference uh, between the two conditions. So the, the, each of the different symbols is a different subject, and the uh, uh, two cycle per degree cases are in blue. Uh, the four cycle per degree uh, are in red. And so this is just showing you the, um, uh, the value, the beta value for the horizontal carrier versus the vertical carrier. Again, what we expect is that the horizontal carrier will always need to be um, um, stretched, which means it's going to have a value greater than one. Uh, um, where the vertical carrier is going to uh, have, a, have a value smaller than that. So we expect to see, ideally, we have everything would be in this top, uh, top quadrant. Um, 
But that's more or less what we get. And then we get a shift. Uh, we should get a shift uh, down to the right when we go to four times per degree as the uh, mm -hmm. effect disappears. And, and that's what we get. Okay. So that's it. So um, the receptive fields of primary visual cortex tend to be elongated along the, their preferred direction. Um, and our simple model of V1 uh, predicted that that should show, uh, that should result in a population response that's, uh, that's elongated along the direction of the carrier in the, um, in the stimulus. Um, <clears throat> the red atomic shape of BSDI responses um, so this population response is actually in, in, in V1, image in V1. Uh, it's also elongated systematically uh, in, the, um, in the direction corresponding to the carrier orientation. Um, and um, most importantly, human observers show perceptual bias that are constant with this physiological orientation dependent response elongation. Uh, so I can, the main conclusion here is that there does seem to be a signal embedded in um, the retina topic response, uh, population response of IMP and V1 uh, that can be used to estimate course shape parameters like size and, uh, and aspect ratio. Um, and again, I want to thank my collaborators on this project, uh, A.L. Seidemann, Bill Geisler, and Yuzi Chen, and uh, NIH grants that support. Essentially, just pull out the 
help their envelope by saying how far in the um, how far in, in V1 does this activate neurons? I mean, I'm, I'm of course talking about a very simple case where you have a, a, a stimulus on a, on a uh, zero content background, but just generally, if you you know if you can you can think of just uh, again, I don't know exactly how these are built up, but if you could just query, uh, it could be you know uh, one um, one texture on another, and if you could just look at um, Presumably, there's a way of querying uh, neurons that have a, uh, a, you know, uh, that are roughly tuned to a particular orientation, right? Well, we know you can do that, um, but presumably at the retinal top level, there's a way to do that as well. Yeah, but for example, you may want to know whether an oriented response is actually coming from a contour of an object, or is just part of part of a pattern. And, right, yeah. and the difference between pinwheels and isolation domains and the amount of cross orientation suppression that gets now. And in one case there's a lot, and in the other case there isn't. And so the local structure helps you tell that. So it, it may not give you the whole, you know, the whole shape of the contour, but it, it helps you respond to the contour or not, depending on where you are. Um. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, one thing that one one thing that I used to argue just a little bit against that is that um, a lot of this. So in, in the periphery, right? I mean, one of the things that Tony was showing is that in the periphery we don't actually have very good localization of exactly where contour elements are. For example, you know, there's like there's stuff that's oriented in this direction, you know. And so I'm mainly just ta I'm mainly talking about the, per the periphery and lots of lots of you know, nice little contour joining sorts of um, effects that people get in in the phobia fall apart in the periphery. Yeah. That's why you move around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Thank you.